Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived exclusively to let me spend more time than I'd ever get on the radio with interesting people. Um, and, and well, I, this week's guest does need some introduction, Bassam Youssef, but less introduction than you would have needed last September. Mm. for example, because you are um, a, a, an American citizen now, but an Egyptian comedian and TV host. Um, you don't want to be an activist. Uh, reading your life story, it seems to be a recurring theme. So you don't want to be a political activist, but you keep kind of becoming get, a political activist. Get dragged activist. into it. <laughs> yes, with every new situation. And and then for the benefits of, of British viewers and, and listeners, um, I suppose we should begin with the thing that brought you to most of their attention, which would be an appearance. So, I mean, considering it's a television show that's widely regarded to have failed by every conceivable measure, the Piers Morgan television program was rather successful for you. Uh, what, what, was it considered a failure before I came on? It's been axed now. Oh, no. Well, it's not on normal television anymore. Oh, like it's it's, it's a YouTube show. Yeah, because, yes. you know, normal television no longer matters, apparently. Yes. According to... A lot of things have uh, stopped mattering, a lo- uh, yes, especially in the last few months. That's very true. But it, but, it, but it's fair to say that that... I mean, you're, you're now in London to do some gigs at the Hammersmith Apollo. I don't think they were on the schedule, were they, before you made that appearance? Uh, well, we were actually discussing my London tour even before all of that happened. But what ha- what was different is that the frequency of the shows and the number of the shows that was added, that we 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 thought that was going to be like a, a repeat of last year tour, which is like ten cities, mm. ten shows. Now it's twenty five shows, so uh, it has expanded exponentially, and also the size of theaters have actually uh, expanded. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it made a huge difference. I have to say, uh, who who's normally in your audience for a European gig? Who would you normally see in your uh, audience? I would say sixty to seventy percent from Arab origins, and right. and the rest from the that are not Arabs because yes. the show's in English. It's a very international show. Uh, everybody can relate to it, even if you're not involved in the Middle Eastern politics, because it's not really about politics; it's about a personal story mm. that has some politics in it. And it's called the Middle Beast. Yes, it's called the Middle Beast. And uh, it's a pun on where I'm from, but also it tells a story inside my show, uh, coming up with a new idea how to present ourselves as Middle Easterns. Um, we, will, we will work towards that, but I want to begin at the beginning, which is 1974 in Cairo. Um, you, you, I, I think perhaps your background, your childhood was very establishment in one way. Your father was a judge, your mother a university professor. Uh, we'll talk shortly about your medical career. But but was it a, I mean, were you conscious of privilege growing up? Were you aware that you were living a, a, a fairly gilded life? Not really, because uh, I, I, as a member of, my, my family was a middle class family. But uh, 1986, when I went to middle school, there was the the whole wave about international schools opening up in Egypt, and it was very expensive. So they put me into that one of the first one that opens there, and it was above their pay grade. They actually had to push themselves in order to put me into a, a like a good education, which is a private education. Mm. So I spend my middle school and my high school with people who are much more richer than me. <laughs> so I was the 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 guy who was not that much money into a very privileged school. And when I finished the school, I I got good grades to go into medical school. Now, medical school in Egypt is government right. school. So now I am the sissy boy from the private school who now cannot fit with the people in the medical school. Uh, so it seems that all of my life, I usually had a problem to have a sense of belonging. So so an outsider's perspective, an outsider yeah. on, on your own mm-hmm. environment. Yeah. What were you like at school? I, 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 let's start before you went to the international school when you were still at a re- relatively normal school. Were you a good student? Yeah, I was a nerd, I, and I and I was good at you know playing sports. So that's that, that the two things that went with me into the middle school. Uh, I was a nerd. I was good at playing sports, but I wasn't boyfriend material. So uh, I I was one of the cool kids. <laughs> w- 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 was medicine an early ambition? Or, or? no, it's a, it's a, it's an evil necessity. <laughs> you have to go into to uh, satisfy your parents. So you could have gone into the law. You could have followed your father into the law. Yeah, but it's it's you, in in the Middle East to be prestigious. It's either engineering or medicine. Is it? And, yeah. and so 
you must have had some sort of passion for it. I mean, no. you can't. No, come on. You can't have been entirely cynically pursuing. No. Really? No, I didn't know what else to do, so I went into medicine. But you were quite good at it. Uh, you passed all your exams. I, it, I, I, yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it, I'm, I think I'm a type of person so that I have to achieve the job, no matter how bad the job is, because it is it is the only only way. There is no other way to do it. So if you put in a situation, you have to finish the job, even if you don't like it. That's I, I got that from my parents. It's okay. like it doesn't matter if you like the job, do the job. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I'm struck. I mean, you, you became a heart surgeon. Indeed, you were working in um, cardiothoracic surgery hmm. at the time of the of the Arab Spring, but. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm interested in, in the sort of amateur psychology of where the performer appeared. Were, were you a clown at school? Because you say you were a nerd. I not, don't think you can be a nerd and a clown. Can not, you? not. I mean, like, I'm. I was not. Like, I was not one of those people who were closed off nerds. Okay. I, I still can joke, but I wasn't specifically the class clown. I wasn't specifically the funniest person in medical school, or in the, I was just like a regular guy. And I think. What I did was just like a recipe that I did a show that resonated. And then suddenly I found myself being offered a television show. So now I had, now I find myself into a job. It doesn't matter if I know anything about it, I will have to do it. So there was, it never, is, there was never any ambition there. You're not a, na no. na a natural show off, for example. No, no. It is, I, I think I just found myself into the situation and like all of my life, whether you find yourself in a situation you understand it or not, or whether you like it or not, you have to do the job. Um, we've jumped ahead a little bit. I, ju I just want to know a little bit about the responsibility of, of, of being a heart surgeon. I mean, d d because I, I'm not going to let you be funny about everything. You, you hold life in your hands in a job like that. Well, you the biggest responsibility as a heart surgeon is not to kill people. Yes. Well done. <laughs> so that's uh, <laughs> to try to murder as few people as possible in order to to get there. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I managed my casualties for a bit. Uh, I did it indiscriminately. Did you enjoy the work? Did you enjoy the work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but here's the thing. There's a lot of glorifying around surgery. Yes, a lot of true. it is actually very boring stuff, paperwork, uh, logistic stuff. The actual time that you spend in surgery doing, in, in theater doing surgery is not that much especially when you're growing up. You do a lot of okay. like dirty work, as they mm. say it. So it's not enjoyable. And there's a lot of long hours. And there's long, you're deprived of being a regular human being who want to have fun. So were you conscious of wanting to get out? Or, or oh, yeah, the whole time. So I, w I was trying to wait for any opportunity for me to get out. Like what? Another uh, line of career, like being on television. <laughs> if I'd met you in 2010, mm. and I'd say, where are you going to be in... 10 years time or 20 or 14 years time what would the, you my best answer would be like i would be uh, a doctor at some Cl cleveland clinic hospital or or in in america okay because i wanted to continue being a doctor in the united states because i like living in the united states i like the lifestyle but uh, i wouldn't even imagine being into the public eye whatsoever no what about political engagement were you were you were you engaged politically as a no. student you're not not no no not at all I was all uh, for me also I was I viewed politics from the outside. Yes. And even when I went in I wasn't even that educated but I just so I it's not like about like you don't have to understand politics but you can understand the absurdity of it. And this is I think where comedy comes from. Mm. So even when I talk now about what's happening in the world I don't even have to be an expert to say that like this is absurd what's happening and we need to talk about it we need to criticize it it's not uh, they try to shut you down by telling you that you're not the experts you don't understand it's like well make me understand because whatever you're telling me doesn't make any sense there's a timelessness to that isn't there i mean mm -hmm. it, you know the, the, there are greeks that really took the piss out of power it's, mm -hmm. it's as old as humanity itself yeah well i think it comes with the job if yes. you acquire that much power the least you can do is you give up some of that privilege in being made fun of or being criticized or being held accountable but the thing is people don't want to do that because once you start you never finish and they will be exposed to the fraud they are so i i guess you know the the, the seminal moment becomes january 2011 when when the revolution began in in cairo um president mubarak's position became surprisingly precarious surprisingly quickly considering that he'd been in power for 30 years yeah. but but your initial involvement was as a doctor i think you attended the um protests to 
treat people. Yeah, uh, I wanted to be involved in whatever capacity I can. I couldn't uh, shout slogans. I don't know how to, I don't know what's the rules of combat or engagement or how to rebel. So I went there and did what I can do best. It's just like to treat people's wounds. So, so what would you, would you literally bandaging people up and, yeah. and, and, and yeah. sending them on their way? Yeah, I tried to kind of go to the first uh, lines to throw a rock against the, you know, the attackers. And I think my, my hand slipped and it hit one of, of the people on our side. So I, 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 I went around and I, I just like walked back because it was very embarrassing and also very dangerous because people would think that I am some sort of a mole and being planted by by the enemy. So I, I had to escape and clear myself. And just and, and I think like the white coat kind of like is, uh, like saved me because it's like, oh, I want to just like do, 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 do. It's the like, perfect oh, cover. It's yeah, like yeah. having yeah. a Monty Python. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean yeah, I'm, I'm like, you know, like, you know, so all of these casualties that like I was treating, I am responsible for at least one of them. <laughs> How many were you? <laughs> well, but, but you knew what side you were on. I mean, because you knew that you were, you had an affinity with the people that were protesting against the government. Yes, I mean, you can say it like that or simply say that it is me it's a form of rejection of the status quo, which like you cannot just have a dictatorship that goes on forever. And uh, and you know, it's it's about the accountability and holding the government accountable and having mm. the transparency, which you which is actually the basis of democracy. I, uh, but um, and I, I think a lot of people felt that kind of passion to be on that side. Of course, that we were disenfranchised as time went on of because course. of the failures of so many failures and so many mistakes on many sides. But at the time that we believed to be that to be the right path. So it was more of a philosophical grievance than a material one. It wasn't about the state of your life. It was about the principles of, of democracy. No, yeah. I mean, as I said, I was middle class. I didn't really have many complaints, but I think that my country deserved better. Mm. Uh, you don't really have to be on the worst possible socioeconomic level in order to revolt about against uh, a certain of course. type. And also, it doesn't have to be revolting by marching the streets and throwing rocks. You can simply revolt about like how your elections are being handled or who's buying your election or who's controlling the election, even if we are in a democratic first world country, because there's a lot of that to be discussed about that, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to be a dictatorship in order to have your decisions and your and and your uh, say in deciding your future to be taken away from you because uh we talk a lot about the dictatorship in the middle east we talk a lot about like the lack of transparency and accountability but we don't what we don't talk about for example the american election is like how the american elections is bought and sold for lobbies of special interests, whether they were domestic lobbies or the lobbies that work for the special interests of a foreign country, especially if it's a country that we fund, it's a client state. So this is this is the kind of things that like, you know, uh, revol revolting against a certain status quo doesn't really need to have to be violence from the streets. So you don't, you don't, I mean, partly because of your perspective, your personal perspective, you, you've got, you're not under any illusions about the Western democratic model being good and middle eastern dictatorships being bad you see i mean i see i see a lot of potential in the western democratic model i think there's a lot of hope but it the, what we have is an idea a very flashy idea that is in yeah. uh, that in reality has been uh sabotaged uh i mean the, because you end up going to, to to have all of these promotions and all of these encouragement to go vote Mm. And we go vote for a certain candidate. And then that candidate does end up when they succeed, when they when they go through the primaries or the, the elections, when they win the elections, they don't really represent your special in interest, mm. the voter. They represent the people who give them the most money for their next campaign, for the next election cycle, which is pharmaceutical countries. Uh, or in the military industrial complex or the NRA or the APAC. I didn't vote for that. No. Um, uh, although, I, I mean, you've been strong on, what's the word I'm looking for? Your lack of enthusiasm for Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. I, I've enjoyed what you've said about the the paucity of the argument that you, you, you're going to vote for him because that guy's so bad. You, you want a system in which you're voting for someone because they're good and they're going to actually represent what Helps. Well, it's a, it's a sort of gaslighting, isn't it? When yes, you go in and you go and you bla blame minorities that really don't swing the elections. They did the same thing with black people. They did the same thing with Latinos. 
they blame them. They and while the sixty six percent of white people vote for Trump, mm. and you come and blame the one percent that you disfranchise by just like refusing to uh, stop the killing, which is very hypocritical and 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 very manipulative, to be honest. But even if there was no war, the fact that you have uh, a foreign agent. Like of course they they're acting as a local agent because it's like it's all 100 percent American donors, but they represent a foreign agent or foreign country. So they they brag openly on their Twitter account mm-hmm. by all of their candidates being uh, winning their elections, and they say supporting Israel is good for politics. And I don't understand. I mean, I I I, I left the Middle East to belong to the greatest country on earth. Then to find that the greatest country on earth decisions is run by Tel Aviv, it just it doesn't work. It just it it's really mind blowing, and it's, they're open about it, and they're open about it, and they brag about it, and they go and they go and they pump money against you if you don't if you speak otherwise. Um, I think there was a politician her name is Donna Edwards. She's a congresswoman running for the seat of Maryland, and she second second term, great, very popular. APAC pumped money against her, and her her what's her biggest sin? Did she oppose any of the pro-Israeli resolution? No, she just voted present. Mm. And that was enough to get the wrath of the APAC to be to, and then fail her elections, despite Nancy Pelosi, uh, uh, you know, supporting her. Andy Levine, Andy Levine is a Jewish Congress person from the state of Michigan. And he even has a video, very funny, he said like, I swear to God, I'm Jewish. <laughs> and he said like the only, and he said like the uh, APAC p- like pumped $4 million against him. So he would fail the election just because he is one of the very few Jewish voices who disagree with Israeli policy in the Middle East. So when you have all of this, you wonder like, wh- 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 where's my votes are going to? Yes, where's the transparency or, or where's the accountability? If, if Joe Biden receives over his lifetime $9 million from APAC, who does he have his loyalty set up for? America, if, uh, if Chuck Schumer gets 1.9 million, if Robert Menendez, Get two point five million dollars from APAC. You understand that APAC has pledged to spend hundred million dollars mm. in order to fail anybody who voted for a ceasefire in the Congress. Is 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 this? If this is not buying your elections by a foreign agent, I don't know what is. Um, you don't feel. I, th- I think you probably just answered my next question. You don't feel that Chuck Schumer's intervention, seeing as we've dived straight into this, we may as well. Fill our boots. Chuck Schumer's intervention is not as significant as some comments. What kind of intervention? Well, recently coming out and and, and using the word pariah to to describe. Empty words. Israel. Doesn't matter. Just, it matters in, in saving face. But at the end of the day, when all of these people vote to send more money, more weapons to the Israel, so mm-hmm. they cannot fool me with like empty rhetoric like this. While they still vote with Israel with everything and still send it money to kill more people. I mean, is but Israel is gets fifth one fifth of the foreign aid of Israel, of America, and it's the only country of the, that's not a third world country on that list. How, how surprised were you when you settled in America by the the the, the widespread narrative in, in this area? How, and by, by how little perhaps the average American or the average European, the average English-speaking European would know about what you've just described? Were you... I, I have to say that I understood it because at the end of the day, living in America has its own rhythm. You know, you yes. have ESPN, you have Netflix, you have HBO. You have like very demanding lifestyle and you might have like 10 to 15 minutes of of news. I myself didn't know all of that. Sure. I mean, I, I, I got kind of shoved into this conflict after the Piers Morgan interview. Yes. And then I found myself being asked more and more and more in the second interview. So I said, well, I need to be prepared because also as the Arab, uh, average Arab, I knew about APAC, but I didn't know that they are that much involved. They're I much see. more in control. So as a way that like I started to educate myself and read more, you find myself like this is... How has this been going on for all of these years and nobody even talked about it? Maybe this is part of the outsider perspective. Mm. You come from the outside, like how you guys are living like that. And now, and now you, is there an element of mission involved in you wanting to bring it no, to it, other people's it, attention? It's or? not a mission involved, but since I'm com- uh, like I work in comedy, I find this is very funny. Yes. I, <laughs> yes. I, I, I find these discrepancies and the, I, I talk about it not in anger, but it's like in satire. It's like, <laughs> how are you guys telling us that this yes. is democracy? Because it's obviously not. So it's satire, like it's Jonathan Swift type satire, isn't it? It's describing the, the ridiculous, but, but real. I'm I'm just holding a mirror to the people. It's like yes. you guys like what you're seeing. Do you like that? Do you do you really like that? Because because 
I, the, the mental gymnastics that you, because I've, I spent all of my life in the Middle East and I know how people can go and live in denial mm. when something is very clear. I've seen that. And now I see it again in the United States, but That's in other really matters. Interesting. So this whole idea about like going through all of these mental gymnastics in order to tell yourself that everything is okay and it's, it's, it's okay to, to, to do things like that. I don't think it is. Well, let's let's go to the moment when you when you change lane then, because it was exactly about holding up a mirror to power. You 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 were in Tahrir Square, um, as we've said, treating and occasionally injuring protesters, <laughs> and you decided. I mean, this is quite a leap, isn't it? You decided with your friend uh, Tarek Al Kazaz to to start filming skits. Do we call them? What do we call it them? It was a, a cheap version of the John Stewart uh, yes. Daily Show, five minutes videos that. I didn't think it would go anywhere. But why did you do it? What was, I mean, why did you want to? I, at that time, I was waiting for my papers to arrive from Cleveland because I was going to start a, like a, a medical, uh, like a, a surgical uh, fellowship. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I always want to, I always watch John Stewart and maybe we'll do a video and a, a few videos. They will, they maybe, and they will be discovered on the internet a year from now after I come back from the uh, fellowship. And when that happens, maybe they will ask me to be a writer on the show. Okay. Because I didn't believe that I could be a TV host because I have a, a speech impediment. I have an, in Arabic, I cannot troll my R's. Okay. Which is uh, actually a speech impediment in Arabic. It's a much bigger problem in Arabic. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like Spanish. You know, <laughs> yes, in like Spanish, yes, you, yes, if you cannot, you have to roll your R's, especially. Yes. So I couldn't troll my R's in it. So my, my career as a TV host was doomed from the beginning. And even Tari Azez, my friend, he took my video before we released the first video to a big, uh, big time, big shot producer. Yeah. It's like, you know, there's a new guy, like, want to watch it? He's like, you bringing me a guy with a speech impediment? Oh, there's, I mean, there's a curious hinterland there between ambition and dream. You, you didn't think it was an entirely unreasonable prospect, but presumably you wouldn't have bet your house on it happening. No, I mean, I, I just put it out there. It, it was kind of, after the revolution, after the first few weeks, there was like a, a sense or a state of fluidity. Of course. Anything yes. can happen. Yes. There's kind of dreams. And so people were just like putting uh, their dreams up there. Yeah. There are a lot of people like put content even before me. And it was just like, this is what happens when you have this like sense of freedom. You put dreams out there. And it just happened that I was lucky that mine, got, people got hooked to it. Des describe it for people who haven't seen it or for people who can't understand. Well, it was, it was a five minutes uh, t like TV episodes on YouTube, t 2011, very early in the YouTube days. And I basically kind of like took the, the state-run media clips and I made fun of it like Jon Stewart does with his shows. And people, it resonated with people and it just exploded, went viral. And then suddenly I am being offered my first television show. It's hard for people to understand that it, uh, what revolutionary comedy or commentary is, if you've grown up here or in America, because what, what was happening, I think, was that people had never seen that before in a, you might be able to take the mickey behind closed doors, but as you would discover later with, with the, 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 the man that came after Mubarak, um, this would have been sedition, what you were doing. Uh, well, a year a, previously. Yeah, yeah, not, not a year, only a few weeks. Well, of course, yes. Yeah. Of uh, course. And uh, so it's got the thrill of the unknown, and the, oh my gosh, I can't believe that someone's doing this. It's yes, part of the process. Yes, it is again. That's why it's resonated with a lot of people. Mm. People just like found what they always dreamed of, kind of, you know, materialize in front of them. I'm interested. I won't dwell on this unduly, but I'm I'm interested in the. The the, the the sort of duality here, the idea that you were quietly getting on with your life as a surgeon, you were you were satisfied, you, you, you know, you had aspirations, either geographically, as much as anything else to be somewhere else, but you weren't living a life of anger. You weren't in a garret writing furious tracts no. against the government. Or, no. And yet when the planets aligned, when the moment presented itself, you found yourself perfectly positioned to it doesn't, I, I, I think I was inspired by the, the satirical commentary of John Stewart because okay. for me, I was watching it for years and yes. I wonder if we'll ever have it in Egypt, how it would, would, uh, how it would look like. Okay. So it wasn't like a more of a passion of the politics, but it was more uh, of a passion of the art. Yes. Okay. Of the, uh, and this is why I didn't actually go in with anger. Yeah. I went in it with like, I like that kind of model of comedy. I wish I can replicate it. So, it so the material is secondary to the style. It's it's it's. Maybe, I, mean, yes. I know it needs to be about 
politics and gov and news, but actually you're an enthusiast for the for the medium. Yes, but the style is everything. Of yes, exactly. The right. style is everything, right? Because you can choose to be a go in at a style of anger, yeah. of uh, of uh, of you know. Uh, rallying people, or you can just like choose, choose comedy, which I think it's more difficult and it's more uh, sensitive, but also very, it is difficult actually. So, so when you're saying that you're not, when you say that, when you insist that you're not an activist, in a way, what you're saying is that you're not a polemicist. I don't know what that is. But, but where you're not a, 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 a kind of, a polemicist is the professionally angry person. Oh, is Which that can it? also be comedy. Yes, but uh, you know. Well, you can you can be angry about things while do be doing comedic stuff. Of but, course, but I think it's. But you're comedy. not coming at it from that angle. Yeah, I I, I don't think so. I, I, because you know, sometimes we we are human beings, so sometimes we are angry. Hey, of course. But but you try as much as possible to say, you know, instead of like. Wow! How can this go on? It's like, I, yeah. I, I, are you guys serious? How yeah, is this going yeah, on? Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, how yeah. is this happening? <laughs> and you just like explain to me, explain to me how is this works. You know, when I want to talk about like you know Brian Mast, you know, like a a, 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 a congressman from the, from the U.S. Senate, you know, congress, and he's just like wearing the IDF uniforms. Like, how 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 is yeah. how is this possible? I mean, th just like asking these questions, it's just how is this possible, guys? The fact when you ask. Like the discrepancy that we said or the uh, duality that we see from Western media. We've been lectured by Western media for so long about transparencies and, mm. and, and equality and justice. And then they have run with, they became mouthpieces of the Israeli media and propaganda for, for months now. Decapitated babies, yes, master, decapitated babies. Mm. Gang rapes, yes, master, gang rapes. And no question asks, no question asks. And then when, even when the Israeli media said that this is all lies, they didn't bother to even translate that into English. They didn't even talk about it. They didn't apologize. They didn't say, guys, I think we messed up. I think we ran the decapitated babies wrong and we're sorry. All of this has been proven wrong. There was only one baby killed Mila Cohen at the age of 10 months and we, there was no fault, but none of them. You had ne never seen a single apology from BBC or CNN or Sky News saying, we're so sorry, we're on with this whole. But there's, the, I mean, part of the problem that you <clears throat> describe is caused by the absence of pressure in the opposite direction. So there's no pressure put upon the broadcasters that you described to correct the record. There's no pressure. The Washington Post have been fairly creditable in this field, I think, more, more so than the other media that you've mentioned. They, they've done some... Um, uh, not, not like some of their headlines were weird. Palestinians yes. killed. By whom? We don't know. Yes, but in the specific context of, of correcting the record, I think they've gone a little further than some of the other organizations you mentioned but but you, you you describe something which feels normal to those of us who grew up here uh, or, or at least has felt normal which is the absence of pressure in the opposite direction the absence of of anybody saying well you need to do that now or you need to do that now. you need to correct that now that that is wrong oh no there, there is pressure on those people when they speak about israel if they speak about israel and criticize it you will feel the pressure oh i get that yeah I know, I, so I, it, it comes from the fact that like when you speak i think it really comes down from they don't look at palestinians as ho ho human beings who deserve to live mm. so they will follow whatever mental gymnastics in order to accept the killing of masses of them, like believing all of these ridiculous stories and not even apologizing for them. Yes. Did Were you clear about that from from very early on last October? Did, did you, were you, were you fearful about that? Because there was a lot of talk about proportionate response mm -hmm. and there is no doubt about the um, atrocious nature of the October the 7th attack and and the necessity of response but were you clear in your own mind or fearful in your own mind that we would be heading towards the kind of space that we find ourselves in now when we were when i was first asked this dreadful question what's a proportionate response it is a mad question uh, what's a proportionate yeah. response at that time 3000 palestinians were already killed yeah now we are edging 33000 palestinians 11 times and people are asking, what's the proportionate response? This is ridiculous. I'm not asking that. I'm no, no, I'm not uh, talking about yeah. it. I'm, I'm not talking about When I say you, I, <laughs> no, okay. I don't mean that. I mean the indefinite you. I mean yes. the proportion. What is so crazy, James, is instead of asking the questions like, how can we make Israel stop? It's like, oh, mm. how, more, how more civilians can we kill mm. that, that, that is okay? And the thing is, you see. But there's no limit on that now. 
I there's no there, it doesn't matter anymore the, the thing is the number you see but the pretense has gone as well the the idea in say january perhaps certainly in december of last year that there would be i hesitate to use the phrase saturation point but you know what i mean there would be a point at which it became too much the idea that netanyahu in particular recognizes that has gone that's gone how, completely wh- why wh- how would that make a difference yes exactly it doesn't make any difference we spend so much time deciding what's the threshold of being killed and yes. then we are at the point of saying oh i hope it stops and the thing is you know what's the sad thing james if israel decided to stop the killing today there would be no accountability people will actually praise netanyahu for stopping at that number for not killing more mm. and we will forget all of the atrocity that israel has done over the f- past six months i mean the, the, this is the problem this is the banality of evil this is the idea of desensitizing yourself for the atrocity how many how many horrific things that we have seen and we've become quickly desensitized about remember the little babies in incubators dying we we don't talk about that anymore mm. remember the civilians walking while being just like casually killed remember the people that were stripped down naked and head and we just told that they're hamas remember like how is it was like oh we, we didn't bomb al ahli it is just like hamas misfire and since then they bombed 36 hospitals mm. it doesn't matter anymore it doesn't matter anymore. so how, how long before the the aid the seven aid on the day that we meet we, we learn that seven aid workers have been killed in Gaza yeah it doesn't yeah, yeah and so by the eight, end of the week that won't matter I, that, that won't matter and you know what's the first response of, of israel it's like it's a, 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 road, a roadside bomb by by hamas mm. and they lie and the thing is they lie and the thing is what what the problem is that the western media just lets them get away with it there's not a single you know what it what you know what is so crazy let's say for example what happened in the shifa hospital mm. which is the biggest hospital you know after they they massacred everybody naftali bennett and all of the israeli spokesmen they went in the same exact way 200 terrorists were killed 500 were captured 6000 civilians evacuated zero civilians killed mm. and then you see all of this good job good job yes 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 that's the news now now we have videos footage saying now there were people that were killed mm. by being tied they were like pe- people being bulldozed these are the dead bodies but dead bodies of children and, and women you know what they say uh it's doctored videos it's al jazeera uh maybe they are but they were uh, they were hamas if um, they're not hamas they are civilians if they're civilians they're supporting hamas they voted for hamas and even though they're collateral damage it's fine to kill them it doesn't matter anymore because they will always have a justification and of course we can't put our own journalists in there to uh to provide footage and coverage that would not be yeah, well, susceptible they, to the they, challenges they, that you they described. They don't care. Every time there's but a tragedy, want... they uh, they say, first of all, it's not us. Then they apologize. Then they say, we're going to look at it. Exactly what happened with the International Central Kitchen. You know, it's like, yes. it's, it's not us. Oh, maybe it's us. It we is. were horrified. We're sorry. Oops, we will look let's, into this. let's move on. But Israel have the right to defend itself. Mm. As a journalist, as a broadcaster, part of the problem is that you... You have to operate within the established parameters. So this is why I mentioned the, the, the refusal to let Western journalists into Gaza. So you, you, you have to, you catch yourself, and this possibly is a consequence of the gaslighting that you've described. You catch yourself saying something like the figure you referred to, the 33,000 figure. You say these are figures from the Palestinian Health Authority, which uh, how is how can we believe them? Which is run by Hamas. Well, the subtext is how can we believe them? Sometimes it's explicit. Yeah, and, B- and BBC makes sure that every single time they put a like a, a headline about killed casually, said Hamas run health. So it's kind of yes. like they put the seeds of disbelief. But we we're supposed to believe Israel. Every well, that's the point I'm making. Is that there's nuance? There's yeah. room for nuance here, but there is no nuance. It's a hundred percent skeptical versus a hundred percent credulous. Yes, and you know, you know how is this? This is. This is okay. You have all of these proof of video that's outside of the health ministry of sure. people being killed, and yet, but like in order for journalistic integrity, we yeah. need to bring the other side, and then they bring in the Israeli spokesman. Like we didn't kill any civilians. Da, 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 da. Uh, let, let me let me walk you through one of the favorite myths that Israel does: the human shields. For years, they talked about human shields. They tweeted about human shields, although we didn't find a single evidence of Hamas using human shields. And yet, on the internet, you find hundreds of photos mm. of Israeli soldiers shooting their guns while they're having an Israel, a Palestinian kid tied in front of them, used as a human shield. 
We have reports from Israeli media about them using Can the Hannibal Directive, using their own citizens as human shields and collateral damage. You have all of these evidence. And then when you ask an Israeli spokesman about, can you give us a proof about where is the Hamas putting their, their thing? And they give you a CGI 3D video tour of an imaginary base underneath some building. No other evidence. And we have to believe them from that. And you know, when you have all of these outrageous evidence, every time there is an attack that's a little bit too heavy yes what is the first thing that you hear about the television anchors in the west oh well as you know it's heavily populated these are human shields there are collaterals what, what can we do how what is the proportionate response so we go in from is it acceptable to harm civilians e to how many civilians how can, can we, we accept how as a threshold to be killed so israel can defend itself you see how the conversation is really rigged how much of this would you have Known a year ago, how much of none, none at all. None. So you've been on a crash course because your yes. wife is from Gaza. I she, think. Believe me, she is more concerned about raising the kids. She's sure. not into the thing. Of course. The reason I got it is because, like, after the first interview with Piers Morgan, I was now being put in the spotlight to have to speak about that. So I had people reaching out. Do you say like, if why did they book you for that first one then, if you weren't already? Uh, well, I think Piers Morgan, I, I appeared with Piers Morgan a couple of times before and the, the okay. couple, the, one of them kind of got a, got a lot of views yes. when I talk about Cleopatra. And ah, that yes, thing. yes, yes, yes. So it's like, all right, who's in the Middle East? Let's get a, like a, a, it's kind of like, let's make it like a lighthearted thing. Let's get a comedian that I met before. <laughs> and so, was, so I went and it just exploded. I didn't plan for it. I didn't, sure. I didn't call him to tell me, hey, why don't you bring me on? So but, when I got on, I got people reaching out to me, like okay. historians, Palestinians, Egyptians, people who work. With, and I told them, I don't know if I, I cannot go on with the same thing. I can't just like go uh, live on zingers mm. and I cannot live on like sound bites sure. and, and smart so comedy and stuff. I need to yourself. understand what I'm talking about because I don't. So I had that crash course after Piers Morgan and I'm meeting with people and I'm basically trying to study like a nerd. Yes, to to get to, so that you've got so all it's your, a full circle. Being so you're back, back to a being a different kind of nerd, <laughs> a different kind of surgeon. Um, Okay, so let's back up again to when did you realize, because you mentioned it was difficult and, and, you know, we can all say I'd quite like to be like Jon Stewart, but it's not as easy as it sounds. When, when did you realize, A, that you were quite good at this stuff when you were working with Tarek and putting together these little films and B, that it was reaching parts that you hadn't expected very quickly? It was the second season. Right. When the season became... The first season was a pre-recorded television studio show. It was no audience. When I started working with live audience, it just transformed my life, transformed my perception. It was the first time ever. And I just like felt the energy and the energy of getting audiences to feed, to make, to feed into your energy. And it was the greatest feeling ever. I said like, ah, I like that. Was it better than anything you'd ever done before? Yes. yes. Like coming home. Yes. And then, uh, and then I, when I got, when I started all over again from scratch in America in the second language, my second language is doing stand-up comedy five years ago. I feel that again, the really? audience. And of, co of course, it wasn't good at the beginning. I suffered a little bit, but the 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 immediate response that you get from audience. Let's let's look at why you made that move. Um, by the time the second season started, Morsi was was in charge. Muslim Brotherhood. Um, Mohammed Morsi, who was elected, you began in June 2012 mm. and you started criticizing him and his government in much the same way that you had criticized Mubarak and the previous government. Not that Mubarak as much as like the state run media that would be taking the, the mickey out of the yeah. reports because all of the protesters were foreign actors yes. and they were all staged and none of it was. Yeah. So you're treating fake wounds, presumably. Yeah, which is part of democracy. That's yes, like yes. the democracy gave them the authority and democracy gave me the space to talk about that. Yes. But um, any hopes of a new dawn were fairly quickly dispelled under Morsi, I think. Well, for you, you know, as well as for I, Egypt. I, I was also being accused by them of all kinds of things. And uh, they ended up. I mean, being, legal accusations. I mean, this is. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I was. I was. Uh, I was. Into, I was uh, there was a, a warrant for my arrest, a legal warrant for my arrest, and I had to be interrogated for six hours. What was that like? Very funny. Was it really though? I mean, uh, I mean, I was trying to to find the fun out of it, and it, and it found itself in my show now, in my stand up comedy show. So now it's funny, <laughs> but at the time it was a little <laughs> bit stressful. But yes. the fact that you see that's again when you when you take a step back as an outsider and you tell somebody tells you they are interrogating a guy for his jokes for six hours. That's hilarious. It is hilarious. So, and, yeah. and then when you're being, and then when the Muslim Brotherhood were removed, the military came, and then. The military was the popular 
people and I made fun of them. And that kind of vilified me. And overnight, I became the enemy of the state. So I'm hated by the Islamists. I'm hated by military. I'm hated by the people of the revolutionary, uh, you know, tendencies because, you know, I, I didn't stand up and I stay and got jailed for them to be happy. So I ended up uh, uh, angering everybody. Because your target is power. Well, that's the that target of that's punching up, right? Well, of course, but it, but I'm just trying to understand how you can end up annoying everybody. <laughs> but because your target is power, yeah. so whoever has power, and also because the febrile nature of Egypt at the time and Egyptian politics meant you couldn't you couldn't be mildly critical. Of, well, or, well, I'm either I'll anger the people in power because I make fun of them, and I'll anger the people who are not in power because, because you're not in making... the, because in the, in the, how they see it, I'm not doing enough. Yes, <laughs> and and indeed you took. I mean, one of your targets was indeed the the attitude towards the the leader of the military coup, General Assisi. Yes. The, the 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 reverence that people the reverence, who... the the fake propaganda, the fake achievements. Yeah, you know, and I, I like the, the graduation that. was a big moment, wasn't it? When the, you, you dressed up as a oh, the, that's that's with Morsi. That was that military. Morsi? Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's funny, isn't it? How the the the, the, the signs of corruption are actually constant it's just the face of yeah. corruption that changes <laughs> yeah and and they they target the comedians because here's the thing when you make fun of people in power you cannot be afraid of them anymore and on authoritarian figures live on fear they live on the fear and the respect so they if you make fun of them you're taking this away from them you are attacking symbols of the state the is the phrase the, of the symbols state. of the state oh, the symbol of the state yes <laughs> you made me the think foundation of, you, you made me think of putin then oddly when you talked about <laughs> laughing at the, because there is someone who i think is uh clearly incapable of of tolerating mickey Tay, but he's just like the mothership of what you're describing i think uh, 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 the people that you have gone after are like apprentices to that level of totalitarian control yeah yeah that yeah. level so so this this precipitated your move to america can i ask briefly about about how your family dealt with this how, how, how your father perhaps as a judge my was he father, still with us Is my he... father and mom they 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 died i'm sorry very close like within a year okay. 2013 2014 so this is where like my, I was kind of like the 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 public opinion was shifting against me. So thank God I didn't see that in full power. Sure, they were spared. So that was as if the uh, a sign from the universe saying that you don't need to worry about that part of the world. Yeah, so well, I, it, I was going to say I don't I don't want to. I mean, it is liberating in a way. Yeah, and yeah. Some authors, I think I interviewed Ian McEwen, and he said you can't write while your parents are alive. You can never write the book you want to write exactly because they'll read it and they'll think, oh, no. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't even. That would. Also, I I do me with that my position. Yes, that I was put in against the government. Sure, I don't want to worry about them back no, home. I understand. So that was uh, kind of, as you said, a relief. And uh, yeah, but I'm 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 struck by your wife's experience. So she's married to a surgeon with your first child, and you press fast forward. <laughs> For what? For, for she like was six, cheated into this. Six, Twelve months later, she she's married to a dissident who has uh, to flee the country. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I, the, I, she, 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 the the stuff that she had to bear, and, uh, and she is like one of the most. She is the su most supportive person in my life. She must be. She is like she is supportive by just like not trying to do anything or put any more pressure, accepting things as they are. And which makes a huge difference. And 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 you had to get out of of Egypt by this point. The yes. police were raiding the production companies. They were arresting your colleagues. You were told that, or a producer of yours was told that they would continue harassing everybody if you continue to speak publicly about the government. So you have two choices effectively, which is to stay put and tone it down, or to clear out. I left because I didn't want my presence to. And even even when I left, I I also had. There was a part moments of anger that I went into like a rant against the government, but every time I would do that, people from Egypt come it's like Basim, you're hurting all of us. Uh -huh. And I had to stop because you don't want to, to what you say having to affect the people that don't have to do anything with it. It's it's um So when I speak right now Yes. About what's happening in the United States and the effect of the the Israeli lobby, I do that because if something happened it will affect me. It will not affect someone else. If it will affect my, my career, it will affect my status, but it will not affect. So I'm responsible for what I say. That is why a lot of people are like, why don't you speak about what happens back home? Because like, if I speak, other people will have to pay the price for it. I understand. H h has it affected you much? I mean, Well, I mean, I lost a couple of opportunities in Hollywood. De definitely the offers from Hollywood dried up pretty much. 
uh, I was called all kinds of things of anti-Semitic. There have been in, uh, uh, attempts to cancel some of my shows. They couldn't. They they succeeded in a couple of uh, instances, but not in the rest. So uh, and there's all this kind of like uh, uh, witch hunt of like anybody who speaks about the uh, the policy of a certain government to be called uh, all kind of uh, threatening things. Is it changing in the last month? I think uh, I talked about this in a in an interview. The whole thing about being anti-Semitic, called an anti-Semitic, it used to be like a horrible accusation. Not anymore. People are just like, ah, it's, uh, they're not going to play this game because anymore. it doesn't hold true. It doesn't hold truth because they're calling uh, Jewish actors and comedians and politicians and rabbis anti-Semitic. So where and, does and, it stop? And, and even I know you're unimpressed by his contribution but but it, what chuck schumer said would have qualified as anti-semitic yeah they call him but then he, he comes back to it we used to be self-hating jew yes yeah, yeah. so, if you're jewish it's self-hating jew yes. or a capo capo is basically you are the informant that that's the name that is being called if you want a a, a jewish person who become an informant in in, right. in auschwitz and oh, the, the, so they call them a capo yes I've so, seen that. so like i'll give you an example of how this is so hypocritical Ellie Stefanik, she was a Republican senator, mm. I guess, or a congresswoman who led the kind of a witch hunt against all of the heads of the Ivy League universities, calling them as like, you are promoting anti-Semitic mm. policies in universities, right? Like yeah. anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic. And yet she in, uh, openly endorses Carl Palladino, who is who, who's a Republican senator who openly said that Hitler is a great leader and we need to learn a lot from him. We okay. need a, so you see, you see, you see how... The, like uh, someone like Robert Spencer, mm. who is the yeah, full of white supremacy, the former of alt yeah. one wh white, who actually applauded Israel for ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, and it's like Europeans need to learn from that. Yes, and yet he goes into rallies and he said like Jews will not replace us. You see the discrepancy. Yes, we course. love Israel, but we hate the Jews. Well, uh, there's, there's, so this whole thing about anti-Semitic is empty. It's stupid. It's lost its bite. It still hurts. I mean, it's still in the context, obviously, of the Holocaust. It's still a no. They can't use the Holocaust to blackmail us anymore. No, but but as as someone who is not being blackmailed, it's still a it's still perhaps more hurtful than other insults than other no, criticisms no, but no, you've, you have no, you always no. been immune to that no i wasn't you developed no, no, no. This? no 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 it's this that, is in, the, in the last seriously in the last seriously like even three months ago yeah. no 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 I just, that's what i but, asked but, but the, 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 that's that's too much now like you cannot mm. just uh, you cannot emotionally blackmail with this empty thing i mean uh Misha Gassen, which is like a, a, a jewish author who yeah. was uh, nominated for the uh, Anne arnett uh, Hannah Arnett uh, reward, uh, uh, award. The banality of evil author. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She she uh, she wrote a, an, an article called "In the Shadows of the Holocaust." She was comparing what Israel is doing to Palestinians, what happened at the Holocaust, and she was denied her award. Mm. She's Jewish, mm. so this whole thing. Uh, and of course, who can't uh, forget Jonathan Glazer? Jonathan Glazer who's a Jewish artist who did this movie, Zones of Interest, yes. he was talking about the banality of evil, the, what I yes, talked about, about absolutely. the fact that like, you can be right next to, an, uh, to a concentration camp and you can plan your barbecues and you can even celebrate what's happening inside, mm. which is exactly what's happening around Gaza, what's happening around the West Bank. The bad, I mean, we don't even talk about the stuff that it, we should talk about. Like, for example, you see how much we have become desensitized about the numbers? Yes. In the West Bank, where there is no Hamas, yes. since 7th of October, 495 people were killed. A hundred of them were children. Is that normal now? Yeah. We don't even talk about that. We don't talk about the the daily displacement, the daily demolition of people. People got set. Let's go into your house, taking your stuff and kicking you out as if it's a normal thing. Mm. And with we the do, full support of people in that in your cabinet, we do not call. We do not talk about that. No. We do not talk about like just. But when you say we, who do you mean? The the west the, the Western media. They didn't talk about. They became so desensitized about this. Whenever you talk about yeah. uh, the, like it's it's it, you see like how the horrific stuff. We're talking about like thir like when you don't care about thirty three thousand people killed. Why do you care about a hundred children killed in West Bank? It becomes so normal, and then you are there. They are they are dividing the West Bank into little Gazas, and preparing them to have a Gaza happening every time. And they will find another Hamas, and they will find a reason. You know what is the, the what really pisses you um, you off Go on. is that those people tell you exactly what they want. Mm. There is a podcast I just saw two days ago, and I was blown away. This is like a, a, a bunch of hachams, like rabbis. And one of the rabbis talk about, even if an innocent civilian doesn't shoot at me, that doesn't make him innocent because in the future, he might shoot at me. Yeah. So he is a threat 
and I need to eliminate him even if he doesn't shoot me because in the future he might. Even babies, babies need to identify as not a threat because babies are the tools of war. And I, even if the babies doesn't shoot, I need to decide for myself if it's a threat or not. This is how they look at things. And the whole world is letting this happen. You see, James, it is, it is very disheartening. It's like they are like looking at you. It's like, I'm going to do whatever I want. Mm. I'm going to kill however people I want. And if you say anything about it, you're an anti-Semitic. You hate Jews. Uh, you are Hitler. You're a Nazi. Yeah. It just, uh, you know, they look in you and tell us like, I'm a horrible, evil person and you can't do anything about it. So if if this wouldn't have been at your fingertips in terms of knowledge and understanding, even, even six months ago, how much of it has made its way into the new tour? I mean, this is what... The no, new... in, the, in my tour, I don't speak about any of this. So what, what, what can people about, expect on stage in Hammersmith on Saturday? My personal story, the story the story that I've been working... I mean, in stand-up comedy, as you know, the first special, the first hour is the one that you spend so much time perfecting. Mm. It's your origin story, right? Yes. So when people come, I want them to enjoy a night of laughter. It's political, but it's personal. I don't mm. want them to expect that I'm going to talk about what happened yesterday because I'm not ready to do it. Maybe there are other people who are more equipped to do it, but I'm not. No. I'm I'm someone who wants to do comedy and still very something that people relate to, and it's deep. It's not just like empty jokes. I think it's I think what I have I think I've developed a, a good hour, and I'm very proud of it, and I want to share it with the public, and I want people to enjoy it, and not have to talk about whatever is happening now because as i said i'm not very ready to talk about it. but it is it's it's a universal story it's a story that you hope yes. will find appeal with everybody it is actually about expectations which is funny that you said what people expect it's yes. about like what what people expect of you as a human being what people expect of you when you have a certain ideas or a certain background and how do you navigate the world that with that kind of different expectations of yours How's it been going down so far? How, how, how's the tour? Well, the tour, I, as I've been touring in the United States, do, doing very well. And I'm doing Manchester, I'm doing Dublin, the National Stadium. Uh, I'm doing Paris, Munich, Hamburg, Berlin, Antwerp, Zurich, Stockholm, Oslo, uh, Malmo, Copenhagen. You've got it off pat. It's yes, fantastic. Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Paris. I did it all. Yes. It was nice. I got it. Yeah. I got it. I don't know. You've got a laptop in front of you. I don't know. No, no, no. Like. I swear to God. <laughs> They have other notes. So this is no. true. No, I can <laughs> confirm. I can confirm. Um, and and it's a, it's a remarkable trajectory, isn't it? From 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 surgeon to world tour level comedian. Uh, at what point, after moving to America, at what point did you allow yourself to believe that this was working? Last year. Only last year. Last year. Wow. Last year, uh, I I felt that my 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 hour is coming together. Because mm. you have to understand, I only started stand-up comedy in English only five years ago. Yes, of course. And there's a very famous saying, this is your your age. If you've been doing it for five years, you're, you're five, five years. <laughs> that, for, so I'm an, I'm, and, and it comes to comedy, I'm an infant. Yes. So I'm a baby. And uh, I, I I was starting to be more happy with my content last year. Okay. Uh, I was doing it more and I was like, okay, it's working now. And when I had this kind of recent blow up, when people came to my show, I was ready. Uh, so it was, it's funny like how timing is everything because maybe if that Piers Morgan interview happened a year and a half ago, yeah, I wasn't good enough. And uh, people would come and be disappointed because A, I'm not gonna be giving them what's happening currently and B, maybe my comedy wasn't that good. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in ambition as a, as a concept. And yet we've come to the end of our conversation really without ever having even acknowledged the existence of ambition. You began in a prestigious job that you didn't really want in the first place. You did, you moved into comedy largely by accident. Mm. The, the move to America and the, and the decision to pursue that career rather than perhaps to return to medicine, that was very deliberate. But do, yeah. you, do you admit ambition? Do you have goals? Do you have things you've mentioned, Hollywood coming knocking and then stopping knocking perhaps? <laughs> I... I, I, I... There was a time where I would tell you exactly what I wanted. Okay. I wanted like a special on Netflix. Mm. I want to be in a Hollywood movies. I want to be in a successful TV series. But maybe I, I think about this and maybe maybe my ambition is to be good at whatever I'm doing. 
if it's a comedy show, I would like to sell out and be good and people be happy. If it's in a political argument, I want to deliver the best possible argument ever and defend my position in the best way possible. Mm. If it's a television show or a, or a, or a movie, I want, if I would act or write, I would do the, I think for me, it, I am not, now my ambition is to do be the best I can in any assignment I get. How different would you have been if if you'd done this in your tw- if you tried to do this in your twenties? How important is it that you have water under the bridge and and a bit of self knowledge or a lot of self knowledge before you become a public figure? I think when I got very I got famous in my th- at the age of thirty eight thirty nine, yeah. and I think it is important. I think it 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 worked for me mm. because you came into this very late in your life, so you 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 act with this newfound fame and newfound success with humility, and you remember that like you weren't like that, and it's not the the normal order of things for you, so you appreciated and you 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 appreciated more and 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 you you try to uh, respect it by doing the work in order to stay on top of it. And you can find details of the tour. You can get hold of tickets at livenation.co.uk. Uh, Bassam Yusuf, thank you. Thank you so much.